And welcome to another edition of Hank Unplugged, the podcast that brings some of the most informative, interesting, inspirational people on the planet directly to you. Uh, This is no exception. Today I have uh, with me uh, someone who's written a book that I think is absolutely fantastic. It's titled Union with Christ, and it takes a subject that is very difficult sometimes to comprehend, much less uh, apprehend. And, and, and it makes it understandable. This is a transcendently important idea. It's at the heart of the gospel. And the person I'm talking about, the author, is Rankin Wilborn. Uh, Rankin is senior pastor of Pacific Crossroads Church in Los Angeles, California. He's a former commercial banker. And he understands in a very practical way the gap between the gospel preached on Sunday and the world that people face on Monday. The book that I'm particularly interested in, again, titled Union with Christ, subtitled The Way to Know and Enjoy God. We're going to have a stimulating conversation, and you're going to be treated to someone uh, that I think everybody should know, Uh, particularly in light of the fact that this book won the Gold Medallion Award from the Evangelical uh, Press Association, and uh, it's a book that we are promoting on the Bible Answer Man broadcast and through the various ministry outreaches of the Christian Research Institute. So, Rankin, good to have you with me on the podcast. Great. Great to be here, Hank. I'm I'm honored you'd invite me. You you know it's it's kind of cool because you you have a a, a church. I, I've only seen pictures of it, but it's, it looks like a downtown Los Angeles church that is somewhat of a cathedral. Well, we have we have two locations. One's on the west side of Los Angeles, and we meet in a large high school, and the other is downtown L.A. and and an old cathedral. So it's. Uh, Different, different sites, but same, same vision, same objective. How did you make that transition from being a commercial banker to being a pastor? Well, uh, not, not easily. <laughs> um, I, I, I came to faith in Christ in my early twenties, and I had then, and I still have. Um, more than 20 years later, I still have a, a deep and abiding conviction that every every follower of Jesus is called to a life of discipleship. And I didn't want to confuse a call to discipleship with a call to pastoral ministry. Um, I I was a commercial real estate lender at the time, and I, I thought, no, I, I, I need to be a commercial real estate lender for Christ. And uh, will probably have uh, more of an influence and impact uh, in, in that capacity. Um, so I feel, felt then, and still feel now very strongly that we need to serve Christ with all of our heart, mind, and soul in, in whatever um, vocation God may call us to. Having said that, God just made it very clear to me that He was calling me particularly into pastoral ministry and I had a uh, fearful sense of that of please please send someone else you know I I uh I I was I was reluctant uh but through a series of circumstances God just made it very clear that that was his will for me and uh and but you know we're we're always we're all we're always better off when we obey God's will so that's uh, here I am. What's it like being a pastor downtown uh, Los Angeles, California? I mean, the dynamics of the culture have shifted dramatically over the last uh, decade or so. Well, you are if you live in LA, you're at the the tip of the spear of uh, cultural conversations that we're having, and I love that. I. Uh, I think one of the ways of thinking about the gospel is uh, we're having a wisdom contest, mm. and we're having a wisdom contest in uh, a cafeteria of ideas, in a plurality of ideas, uh, much, very much like the early church. I, in some ways, it hasn't been this uh, uh, 
the dynamic hasn't been like this uh, since the early church, where there was a marketplace of ideas and uh, different uh, different philosophies of life. Uh, that Jesus is a way, and uh, of course Jesus says He's the way, and um, I believe that Jesus is uh, as as the Son of God, uh, fully God and fully human. That Jesus uh, that Jesus has the best answers to our. The way I like to say it in L.A. is Jesus has the best answers to our human questions. Hmm. These aren't these aren't Christian questions. These are human questions. These are existential questions, and Jesus, Jesus has more compelling answers than the alternatives. So I, I love that. I, I just think, um, as C.S. Lewis said, when you're on the side of reason, you're on the side of God. And I, I just love having that conversation in L.A. and trying in word and in deed to manifest the beauty of Christ that, that Christ way truly is beautiful and it's better. Yeah, and you know, when, when I first started out in ministry with the Christian Research Institute more than 30 years ago, uh, the cults were the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. Today, uh, the cults at our doors are scientism and secularism and narcissism and philosophical naturalism and the like. So the, sh- uh, the scene has shifted quite dramatically. But what I liked about your book, Union with Christ, is I've, I've often thought about the fact that the wolves are at the door. Um, the wolves could be the cults, as I delineated them earlier on, or they could be uh, the far more ferocious wolves of scientism, etc., so it, it, it's very necessary in this epoch of time to, to hang together as Christians. You know, Benjamin Franklin said, if we don't hang together, we're going to hang separately. And, 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 and one thing I noted in your book is that there's a collegial tone to the book. Um, there's, there's a recognition that God has his people in a lot of different places. It's not just in your church. It's not just in your particular tribe or tradition. He has his people all over the place. So we don't want to ever tamper with or compromise the essentials of the historic Christian faith, but around those essentials, there has to be unity. Talk about that sense from your perspective, that sense of an ecumenical spirit, but not wrongly understood. Oh, I, I think that's so important, and in L.A. that's so clear and apparent that we're such a minority of the culture. It's it's almost a novelty, and I live in the middle of Los Angeles. I mean, the, the neighborhood I live in is called Mid-City, and it is, it's a novelty when someone finds out you're a Christian. Certainly a novelty, you know, to be a pastor, and uh, w- when you are such a minority presence, uh, that's also a great opportunity to be a, a creative minority, to be a, um, and to remember, uh, wow, brothers and sisters in Christ everywhere, but especially you know where you live, where where I live in L.A., we we need to remember that, um, as you said it. Uh, so well, Hank, that we are united on the essentials, and um, it's easy to lose focus of that. It's easy to it's easy to get focused on non-essential things, and um, but I mean, I think one way of reading John 17 and Jesus' great prayer for unity is it's important to Jesus that the people who love Him are united around Him, and I I think union with Christ actually is a way to help with that because it says what what we're united around is not an idea we're united around a person and uh this this knowledge of Christ is one that is uh of course it has propositional content but it's also it's always experiential it will always manifest in love um so i i think recovering union with Christ actually has a great one of the fruits of it, Hank, as you said, is building is 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 building bridges and remembering, wow, the most important thing we have in common. Yeah, and we're not talking about 
uniformity necessarily, but we are talking about unity. Exactly. Yes, we. Um, you can't even have tolerance unless you know, and unless you have a keen appreciation of the differences and and a, res, and a, res, a respect for those differences. Um, I mean, I one of the one of the reasons I got interested in union with Christ was reading the early church fathers and realizing, wow, they talk about the gospel differently than we do. Mm-hmm. And that was one of my really first light bulb moments of everyone uses the term the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, but what is the gospel? And and why was the early church talking so much about communion with God? And that was one of my first early questions of why I'm, I'm, I'm a Protestant minister, I happen to be a Presbyterian minister, and I thought to myself, where is all... Where are the conversations on communion with God? And that was one of the first um, breadcrumbs along the trail that got me interested in union with Christ. One of my favorite, favorite all-time quotes, and I have quoted this many, many times over uh, certainly the last five or so years, but maybe even longer than that, is Vladimir Lossky, where he said that the... uh, After the fall, the history of the human race is a history of shipwreck awaiting... Uh, rescue, but the port of salvation is not the goal. The goal is for the rescued to continue on a journey whose sole goal is precisely what the title of your uh, your, your book is, uh, whose sole goal is union with God or union with Christ. Uh, so it's not just uh, getting saved. Uh, it, it is continuing on a journey uh, with, with, with the lover of our souls. Absolutely, we. One of the one of the crises that I uh, noted in the beginning of my book is there are whole pockets of the church that might be clear about what we're saved from, but are we clear about what we're saved for? And I I think we have lost that sense of what we are saved for. Uh, there there is uh, there's a crisis of formation. And there's also a crisis of what what is the goal, and the goal is it's well the reason I start my book with a quote from the great poet Dante is that that's the whole journey of his epic poem, the Divine Comedy. That the whole journey of the human soul is to see the face of God. Hmm. And Dante, echoing Aquinas, echoing Augustine, and of course we think echoing mostly. The biblical writers that the goal is to uh, seek the face of God, and uh, as as First John says, when we see Him, we shall be like Him. Hmm. That's beautiful. Um, you, you talk about union with God being I, I forget the exact term that you use in the book, quite frankly, but it's uh, like an enchanted reality. It's a it, it's an enchanted truth that. Uh, most of us are unfamiliar with it, and, and we're also uh, no longer fixated on enchantment to begin with. Yeah, the, the tagline I use in the book, oh, the question I take up in the book is, if union with Christ is so important, why is it not central and important to many of us? And why is it, if we have even heard of it, it's sort of vague and shadowy uh, and not... Um, the question to ask is, why is it when you ask most people, what is the heart of the gospel, uh, communion with God through union with Christ is not what comes to mind? You know, why is that? And I, I actually dedicate a chapter of the book to that. But I, in one sentence, union with Christ is an enchanted reality that displaces us from the center of our lives, and we live in a disenchanted, self-centered mm. world. Uh, now that there's a lot in that statement, but we, uh, when I say we live in a disenchanted world, to use your phrase, "wolves at the door," well, one of one of the one of the things we're constantly battling is this this myth, this lie that um, we live in a we live in a closed universe, and that this world is all there is, 
and uh, the only reality are the things we can see. And uh, our imaginations have been atrophied. Mm -hmm. And ironically, one of the things atrophying our imagination is the prevalence of our technology. I, I'm not a I'm not a technophobe. I'm 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 a user and gracious. Uh, uh, I I very much appreciate technology because it wonderful things like us talking on the phone and your podcast. Um, but one of the dark side effects is a, of technological overuse is our our, imagi- our imaginations have been atrophied. We. We're not trained and skilled in navigating the unseen world. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, one of the, uh, the, the points that you have made in your book is that there is a power in metaphor, in simile, in, in parables, uh, the power of word pictures to capture the mystery of union with Christ. In John uh, chapter 15, Jesus does that with a vine and its branches, and it's a way to get your mind around how critical it is for us to not be separated from the root that gives us the nourishment. Yeah, that's that's interesting, Hank, you would point that out, because even the question, what is union with Christ, I'm, I'm arguing it's the, uh, at, at the center of the biblical revelation, but even in the New Testament, uh, the New Testament writers use metaphors. Uh, Peter compares our, says we're like uh, stones in a temple. We're living stones. And Paul, Paul says the relationship of Christ in the church is like the most intimate of human relationships, you know, like marriage. Uh, and in another place he says, well, actually it's like the, the, re- the relationship of a parts of a body to their head. That's 1 Corinthians 12. And uh, and Jesus says in John 15, well, it's like it's like vines, it's like uh, branches to a vine, and all these metaphors and the fact that metaphors have to be used, that even our Lord, the most uh, the most brilliant um, human being, uh, even our Lord, the fact that even Jesus uses metaphors shows you there's no way to quite get at this directly. Pictures must be used. Um, G.K. Chesterton said that somewhere. He said, don't believe anything uh, that can't be said in pictures. Um, Pictures must be used. And yet, um, the variety of pictures tells you you need you need a variety of angles uh, to get at this. It's, It's like marriage. It's like bricks to a building. It's like it's like parts of a body to a head. It's like uh, branches to a vine. All of the, the variety tells you how far-reaching this is, and the number of metaphors tells you how important this is. But the fact that metaphors have to be used is is very important. It says this is something that can only be uh, learned by entering in. Yeah, you, you talk in the book about the myth of, of, of heaven when you die, and when you just mentioned you can learn this by entering in, it, it, it reminds me of the salient biblical truth uh, that Christ not only came to save us by his death, but he came to save us into his life, that we can have life now that is life to the full. But the idea so often that is propagated in the Christian world is you you pray a prayer, you receive Christ, and that's about it, as opposed to experiencing this fullness of life where we are, we are intimately related with the living Lord of the universe, that we have fellowship in the Trinity, and we're designed for that very thing. Wow. I, I love how you put that. You know, earlier when you said your favorite quote, I had an inkling that you were going to quote uh, Irenaeus, the early church father, who said the glory of God is a human being fully alive, huh, yeah. I mean, which is, Irenaeus said it, the same thing you're saying about 1900 years ago, that uh, Jesus, Jesus, Pascal put it like this, Jesus not only shows us who God is, 
Jesus shows us who humanity was created to be. And he he shows us the fully human life, and then he unites his life to ours uh, to usher us into... Th- this is the abundant life. Uh, it is life united with Christ on on the path toward communion with God. You do this in your book, but I, I got to get you to talk about this a little bit. I mean, if this is so central, and it most certainly is, if it's central to the gospel, if it's central to life in Christ, how did something that significant, that central, become so marginalized that when we talk about it, it's like we're talking about stuff in outer space as opposed to the real Christian life? Well, that that Hank, you you've asked a big question. As I as I said, I I devote a whole chapter of my book with to that. But I I'll, I'll run through a, a couple of reasons that just uh, we, we've talked about one. We live in a disenchanted world. Uh, we've talked about another. Union with Christ displaces us from the center of our lives. And what I mean by that is. It says that, as, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer phrased it, Christ is at the center, that you have to look outside of yourself to understand yourself, that your self-understanding is found outside of you. Now, even that statement, I, I may have just lost some of your listeners, that's so against the grain of the whole ethos of our time, of radical individualism that says you you discover who you are through asserting your individual identity. And Union with Christ says, no, you discover who you are through knowing Jesus. Um, so that's another reason that it's so against the grain of our um, our cultural ethos. Another reason is it highly depends on the Holy Spirit. And there are big sections of the church where the Holy Spirit remains uh, an anonymous, faceless aspect of the divine being. Um, You you won't understand union with Christ unless you understand what it means that, as as the Bible puts it in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Paul says, Do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? And just take that statement, Hank. Do you not realize this about yourselves? Do you not realize that the incarnate, obedient, crucified, resurrected, and ascended Lord is within you? And why, if your listeners got one thing from this podcast, I would want them to walk away with the incarnate, obedient, crucified, resurrected, and ascended Lord is not only with me, but is within me. Uh, and is is carrying me along. Um, that is, I, I can't imagine anything more precious and wonderful to hear than that. Uh, I could give you some more reasons. I think it's been eclipsed, but those are. Uh, I, I'll give you one more, just if if I may. I, I think a big one is we have is what many writers have called a gospel reductionism. I mean, we we have reduced the gospel to the mechanics of salvation. And that is certainly a part of the gospel. Um, And I might even say it is the heart of the gospel. Uh, I resolve to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified, Paul says. Um, But even that, strictly speaking, strictly speaking, even the sacrifice of our Lord... Uh, was a means to an end. Uh, the The end is not our our personal salvation. Otherwise, that makes us the center of the gospel. The end was to bring us into fellowship with God. Uh, bring us into the divine, the triune life. We don't become gods ourselves but we are welcomed into God's own life. Um, And even that way of phrasing it is not how most particularly Protestants think about salvation. Um, Well, I've 
I've, I've gone off a little bit on a. On no, a I, I don't think it's a tangent. I think it's right on point, quite frankly, because, you know, I was thinking as you were talking about Luther, you know, Luther saying that word became flesh so that flesh could become word. Uh, Athanasius said God became man so that man could become God. And as you've clarified, I mean, we're talking about dependent gods, not gods by nature, gods by grace. But I think it relates to something you're alluding to earlier, this individualistic idea of salvation as though this is a personal decision, this is an individual a rite of passage as opposed to something that is part and parcel of the church, that you cannot do this apart from becoming a member of the body of Christ, because it is within the body of Christ that you receive the graces whereby we can live uh, the Christian life, can receive the graces whereby we can become by grace what God is by nature. We'll never become uh, what God is in the Godhead, but we most certainly become gods by participation, something you point out in the book, that we become, as Peter put it, partakers of the divine nature. Well, Hank, you have, you have put your finger on uh, I, a, a couple of big, my mind is firing listening to you, a couple of big ideas. This is why uh, the Protestant this is why many Protestants have such a low view of the Church, or to use the technical language, why Protestantism has a low ecclesiology. And it's because we don't understand exactly what you were just talking about. And, and it's why, ironically, you know, the early Church Fathers often said there's no salvation outside of the Church. But Luther and Calvin said the same thing. And like, how could they say there's no salvation outside of the church? Because they understood the church is the body of Christ. They understood that to be in Christ is to be united with Christ. And so they, they had a very, very high sense of the importance of the church, which today most Protestants, quite frankly, were so individualized in how we view our relationship with God. We, we've lost that. Um, so, yeah, recovering union with Christ is so, it's, it's so important for giving us a more robust sense of our salvation and a more robust sense of what it means to be in Christ, uh, why the church is so important. Um, well, I obviously think it's the most important doctrine you've never heard of, or, or most people have not heard of, or I wouldn't have written a book on it. Yeah, exactly. So um, it, something very, very interesting in your conversation on this issue is this metaphor of songs. We have these songs that are playing in our minds. One of the songs is a song of radical discipleship. The other is a song of extravagant grace. But these are half-truths. Kind of explain how these two work together. Because on the one hand, if it's radical discipleship, I mean, you get burned out just thinking about it. If it's extravagant grace, you can get into the corridor of cheap grace. And yet, union with Christ gives you the power to be a radical disciple or a radical disciple maker or a reproducing disciple maker. So if you think about the problem that you have in church, and you probably understand this better than most, Rankin, I mean, the church is bleeding out. There's a book a few years ago called uh, The Great Evangelical Recession, but as I've looked at this in macro terms, I mean, there's a bleeding out uh, of the church in general, the millennial generation is walking away from the church uh, by the time they go to college, and, and, and most of them uh, don't come back, quite frankly. So you have this bleeding out of the church, and so the church's task is to make disciples. But you think about making disciples, where does the energy come for doing that very thing, unless, of course, you have union with the vine? Exactly. That, Hank, you've actually put your finger on why, why I got so interested in this idea, this biblical uh, theme 20 years ago. 
if you just stop and ask the big question, and the big question is what what is wrong? What what does the what do God's people most need to hear today? And not just God's people. What what is the message that our culture most needs to hear today? And as a as a young uh, as a young seminarian, it I, I started to see there were there were two different songs, and one song was was what I call the song of extravagant grace that people really need to understand that the gospel is a gospel of grace it's not a grace it's not a, it's not about moralism it's not about earning and working our way to god it's it's about it's it's not the good people are in and the bad people are out it's it's the humble are in and it's the church really needs a message of grace and Brennan Manning is Henry Nowen. Uh, there, there's some wonderful expositors, of the, and that's certainly yes, that is true. But on the other hand, there were other uh, writers just as pious and just as devout who were putting the diagnosis in a different light. Dallas Willard and years before him, Dietrich Bonhoeffer were saying, really saying very similar things. That what's ailing the church today is not that we don't understand grace, it's that we don't understand discipleship. And my little mind was trying to put those voices together. Like how, how do, because we know biblically both voices are important. And we know biblically that neither should cancel the other out. And yet experientially we know we tend to hear one song or the other. We tend to hear one song louder than the other. And e- even many churches, this is just a generalization, but it's either a extravagant grace church or it's a radical discipleship church. But it's hard to find both voices. It's hard to find. And I, I got interested in that question. Why? Why is that? Where? How can I hold both of these truths together without compromising either? And that's where I. I, I want to be very careful here, Hank. I, I don't think there's anything original in my book. I, I I say I'm just excavating an old forgotten treasure. And this old forgotten treasure is the gospel is union with Christ. That the good news is that we are united to Jesus. And that from, one of the old theologians put it, from from Jesus flows a double grace a double grace of what he used the biblical words of justification and sanctification, that we are declared right with God, and then we, we, can, pursue, uh, we can pursue holiness as we have been declared holy. And he said these are distinct, and yet like light and heat from the sun, they are inseparable. And when I read that, I thought, that's, that's it. The gospel is union with Christ, and um, it, it's what allows us to hold these songs together. The amazing grace uh, that asks nothing of us to love us, and uh, love so amazing, so divine, it demands my soul, my life, my all. That union with Christ holds those songs together. You talk about excavating the treasure. There, there, there are some really treasured quotes. I, I love quotes. I mean, I, I pick them up all over the place and I memorize them. But there, there are a couple in your book that I loved. Uh, one is where you said that the song of grace without union with Christ becomes impersonal, a cold calculus that can leave you cynical. The song of discipleship without union with Christ becomes joyless duty, a never-ending hill that can leave you exhausted. And elsewhere you write that union with Christ allows us to hear all the different voices of the Bible, the voices of grace and the voices of demand in ways that complement one another instead of clashing with one another. And I think you're driving at that in your, your comments just now. So often what we do is we juxtaposition one over against the other without realizing that both are necessary. Absolutely. We, yes, you've, you've said it well. Well, you said it well. I'm simply quoting you. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, we 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 end up reading, if I can put it like this, we we end up reading the Sermon on the Mount through the lens of Galatians, and we end up asking questions that sound crazy when we say them out loud. Out loud, like, did Jesus preach the gospel? <laughs> well, it you know back to what is the gospel and. Um, Union with Christ allows us to hear the letter of James and Galatians together without um, without minimi- without subsuming one under the other. Uh, it allows us to hear both. It allows us to hear both those voices. Um, it allows us to read the Sermon on the Mount alongside Romans and say, I, I understand how these voices complement each other uh, full-throated, full-throatedly, and don't, don't cancel, annul, or qualify each other. You know, it, it, when you say that, it, it, it's kind of interesting to me. I was just thinking as you're talking about something that I have been thinking a lot about over the last 10 years, and that is in the Eastern Church, you have this sense of mystery. In the Western Church, you have this snarling log- logicality by which you have to explain everything. And I think there's a certain amount of ha, just relief. You can take a deep breath and say, you know what, I, I, I can live in the land of antinomy on some of these issues that people are killing each other over. Well, you, you've you put, I, and I think I say this in my book, you've put your finger on another reason union with Christ has been uh, eclipsed, is we have lost our appetite for mystery. Many of us have. And Augustine said, uh, we have heard the fact, now let us seek the mystery. And John Calvin, talking about union with Christ, said, I myself um, am glad to exclaim with the Apostle that I do not understand this high mystery, but rather delight in um, feeling my way into it. And this is is John Calvin talking about feeling his way into, delighting in the mystery, feeling his way into experiencing it. And you, you just don't hear many um, Western Christians, particularly who might claim an allegiance to John Calvin, or Augustine for that matter, using language that Augustine and Calvin were quite comfortable using. Yeah, I mean, some of these guys you uh, you only understand through filters. I mean, I think all too often we, we read Luther and we're really reading Melanchthon. Uh, so you're reading Luther through a filter as opposed to experiencing Luther unadulterated. Absolutely. Or, or with Calvin, you read the Calvinist. And now read, you know, the one of the greatest expositors of union with Christ in church history was John Calvin. Um, and I, I, Calvin gets a bad rap because of the Calvinist, but Calvin... It's it's always better, as you said, it's always better to read the original. It's always better to go back and read the teacher and not the students. You, know, you mentioned Calvinists. I, I can't help but think when you're talking about uh, my good friend R.C. Sproul, uh, he was like the quintessential example of the real deal from my perspective. I, I played hours and hours and hours, I can't, countless hours of golf with him and pool and basketball and all kinds of stuff. He loved sports. But he was a guy that was the absolute real deal. I mean, he, he, you get this stereotypical idea of what a Calvinist is, and sometimes it can be pretty snarky. Um, but, but he was exactly the opposite of that. Uh, so sometimes our stereotypes are broken when we actually get to know the people involved. Amen to that. Yes. How is union with Christ the doorway to communion with God? I think that's sort of a, uh, a, a wonderful, memorable phrase, union with Christ communion with God. Explain how that works. Well, I'll, I'll use two, two famous quotes from church history. Um, one is from the early church father, Athanasius. You, you quoted this earlier, but Athanasius said, God became a man that men might become sons of God. Um, the, one way of understanding the, the biblical narrative is that our 
the communion Adam and Eve enjoyed with God in the Garden of Eden was broken when when sin entered the world, and that God, um, by his gracious condescension, out of his love, not out of need, but out of mercy, uh, that God became one of us to restore us to himself. Uh, and he became fully human, as the early church said, the unassumed is the unredeemed. I mean, he he became fully one of us. And that's why, as you said earlier, every part of Christ's life is significant. His obedience is significant. His suffering is significant. His ascension is significant. Um, and well, that's another book. Where are the books on the uh, uh, the relevance of the ascension today? But we, we won't get into that. But every part of Christ's life, he 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 came all the way down, uh, and he um, he entered fully into human life, and he brings us up to where he and the Father are. And he uh, he has opened the door, as as one of the early church fathers put it, dust. Dust now sits on the throne of glory. And this beautiful idea that we have something that even Adam and Eve never had. And we will have something as well. That what we will have will be even greater than what Adam and Eve had. And so that that's one idea. Union with Christ opens the door to communion with God in that Christ by his whole life redeems the human condition. And his suffering and death was the climax and epitome of that, where he was crowned as our king. But the, the, the consummation that his work was not in vain was the resurrection and the, the ascension to the right hand of God. So union creating the possibility of communion. It's, 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 to use the language of Hebrews, our elder brother is taking us by the hand, as it were, and and ushering us into the Father's throne. Am I am I saying that clearly, Hank? Oh yeah. In fact, I was thinking as you were saying it about something you wrote, and that is the perichoresis of uh, uh, the the dancing circle, the interrelationships of the persons of the Trinity, and understanding our salvation as being invited into the dance, or. You know, I, I, I like to talk about uh, something I heard uh, years ago in, in, in reading various books about being brought into the life of the Trinity. Yes. Yes. Very biblical language. You know, John 14, verse 20, or John 14, verse 23, this idea of being welcomed into God's life. Um we Jesus said, uh, we will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Uh, yes, this this idea of, uh, well, again, that's why I opened the book with a quote from, from Dante. That's, that's the Divine Comedy, which many consider, I'm the son of an English professor, many consider the greatest poem ever written in world literature. That is the journey of the soul. The journey of the soul is is uh, to communion with God. Um, and Dante, boy, some if you haven't done already, that would be a wonderful uh, study to do with on one of your podcasts. Dante's guides on that journey. I mean, he starts with Virgil, the epitome of classical learning, and then Beatrice, um, which was Dante's way of saying knowledge knowledge won't get you all the way home love has to lead you to god and but at the very end in book 3 of the divine comedy uh it's it's bernard bernard of clairvaux <laughs> uh who wrote a lot about union with christ it's bernard who leads the, the pilgrim to communion with god and see these are ancient I, when I said I'm not doing anything original in this book, I mean, it, in some ways I'm saying we need to go back to the best thoughts of our best teachers and recover a union with Christ. You know, that's a little off point, but uh, when you're talking about that, I, I couldn't help but think about the reality. I have 12 kids, and I think you have three. 
Uh, but, but the kids in our culture get so wrapped up with technology and the information overload. You just get pounded by this information and you really don't have an opportunity to think about it. But even more to the point of what you're just saying, we no longer read these great classics that are so illuminative in our lives. Uh, that's, uh, yes. I mean, my, my kids are young. They're eight, six, and four, but I, uh, I am, I'm very interested and apparently, uh, a lot of people are getting even more and more interested in what are we doing to ourselves with our technology? And, uh, again, technology is a great gift, but I, I'm one of those people who thinks we're going to look at our technology the same way we look at cigarette smoking. Like, what were we doing to ourselves? And our our appetite for thinking deep thoughts, sustaining deep thoughts, uh, that one of the, ca- uh, to put it simply, one of the casualties of our technological innovation is our lack of depth. And depth is necessary to enjoy life with God. And not not intelligence. God not intelligence. Depth is necessary to enjoy life with God. So what's the difference? What what do you see the difference between intelligence and depth? Well, uh, the way I put it in LA, I, I think people on the people have the wrong idea about LA. People people think some people in LA are shallow and superficial and I'm sure some of that is true but also you know people are highly educated highly ambitious in LA they they are if they stay here they're at the absolute top of their game and the way I I phrase it in LA is there is no correlation between intelligence and wisdom if anything there is an inverse correlation <laughs> But intelligence, uh, as our culture narrowly defines it, says if you are smart in a certain way, you will be rewarded with a certain life, and that is the good life. But the way I phrase it in L.A. is if you saw someone sprinting down the street and they were extraordinarily fast, like Usain Bolt fast, no one would, no one would look at that person and say, wow, look how fast he is. I need to ask him about how to live. I need, to, I need to ask him about how to live a good life. Although that's exactly what we do. I mean, if you have, you, you, you know, you get these guys that are great basketball players. Uh, Stephen Curry, uh, yeah. he played basketball with my boys, and we got to know him really well. And his dad and I are good friends. And and and, but suddenly, I, I mean, I've known Steph as as a, a high schooler. Now he's a, a great basketball player, and all of a sudden. Uh, people are asking him about world issues. He's not prepared to answer those questions. So sometimes they, we, we do make this correlation. You run fast, you're a great basketball player, a great golfer, and now you know everything there is to know about everything. Well, we think if you're extraordinarily talented in a certain area that our culture values, that that qualifies you to speak with wisdom on how to live, Wh- which... Which is why Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, or I, I live in L.A., which is why stars feel compelled or inclined to speak on social issues. And I, I don't begrudge them that. They're, they're using their, the platform our culture has given them. But wisdom, wisdom means skill. The oldest definition of wisdom is skill in living the good life. And my question in L.A. is always, according to whom? Back to this wisdom contest, who is setting the contours of what is the good and beautiful life? And is it Jesus? Is the Jesus way, uh, is union with Christ your highest ambition? Is, that, is communion with God your highest ambition? That's the first commandment. Uh, is, um, or are you letting the culture uh, set your definition of success? And then you're just garnishing that with Jesus. And that's why you get these, these people that have uh, extraordinary uh, lives and accomplishments, but they're, 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 they're filling their lives with empty trinkets because they have this God-shaped vacuum 
that you alluded to Pascal before that that, that only that only Christ can fill and and if 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 Christ does not fill that vacuum then a host of besetting urges uh, replace that which is really central that which is really important and that's how these successful lives devolve absolutely yeah I back back to where we began we're, we're having a wisdom contest and I think I think Jesus is the better way, and un- union with Christ says not only is he the better way, but he he unites his life to yours, and he he brings you along the way. Uh, it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful and it's a true picture of of the goodness of God that he on this journey he unites his life to ours and and asks us to reset our horizon. That that the horizon is now uh, communion with Him. That this becomes our highest ambition. Uh, to use the biblical language, I want to know Christ. Uh, I want to know the Christ that has already taken hold of me. Paul says, "Not that I have already obtained this, but I press on to take hold of Him who has already taken hold of me." Um, that's one of the great pictures of the dynamic of union with Christ in the Bible. You allude to this as well in your book, not allude, but I mean, you actually uh, excavate this quite well. This whole idea of Paul saying, I want to know him and the fellowship of his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow or other to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Uh, Explicate this idea of suffering a little bit. Well, well, that was the shortest chapter in my book because it's really the longest idea. I mean, it's um, Christ is uh, Isaiah, the prophecy of Christ in Isaiah. He is a man of suffering, uh, well acquainted with grief. Uh, to know Christ is to know the man who suffered. Uh, his whole life was one perpetual crucifixion. One one theologian put it, and suffering is integral to to knowing Christ. It's it's integral, uh, but both because that's who Jesus is. He is he is the man who suffered, and to know him is to suffer. But it's also integral in that this is one of the ways God uses to wean us off dependence on ourselves. Uh, so suffering works both ways, um, and uh, suffering is. Um, I think I, I think a simple but profound way of capturing the essence of it is the crucifixion is not simply what happened to Jesus; the crucifixion is who Jesus is, and that. To be united with him is to be united with the crucified and resurrected Lord. And yet Christ, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and raised with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. But we, um, to, to experience that new life, we have to, to use language we're more familiar with, to enjoy Sunday, we have to go through Friday. Uh, we we have to experience that crucifixion, and that that's that's suffering. That's that's God's way. You know, I want to ask you about something else, and this is, this is we seem to have to skate around words today because the words have so much baggage associated to them. They become connotative as opposed to denotative, but it, we used to be able to talk about uh, theosis or deification or divinization, but now we have to skate around those terms because the moment you use a word like deification, I mean, people, they, they come unglued. Well, it's a, it's a if, it, if it is even a familiar word, it's a frightening word because it's it suggests something that people are very uncomfortable with uh, and I, I try to be clear in the book um, that no one in the Christian tradition uh, Catholic Protestant or Orthodox no one has ever said that Christians become divine 
in the sense that they are um, just like God, just like God. We're, no one has said that we become co-creators or that we become, um, uh, we, we are always creatures. Let me put it like that. Um, and yet, uh, we, Jesus has forever hallowed what it means to be human. Uh, so we have this phrase, well, I'm only human, and yet, well, wow, Jesus Jesus shows you what it means to be human. I mean, we to be fully human, I'll say it clearer if I can, to be fully human is to participate in God's own life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, back to the Protestant Reformers, uh, they weren't afraid of this language, Um some of their followers have been, I mean, to the point that it's almost non-existent today. You, you don't hear too many Protestants talking about theosis or deification. And I would say, wow, we've lost something pretty important, not just to our tradition, we've lost something important to the to the biblical tradition, to, to what Yaroslav Pelikan called uh, the great tradition. Um, and we... We have to recover that and not not be afraid not be afraid of that mystery and understand that we're we're not betraying our tradition we're honoring the best of our tradition yeah and I think part of the problem here Rankin is that we don't know our tradition in fact tradition has become a bad word in and of itself so we're we're oftentimes uh, biblically literate but not historically literate. So people have a a sense of the art and science of biblical interpretation. At the same time, uh, they can't think back past the Reformation to the riches of the tradition of the Church that ultimately gave us the Bible. Yes, I mean, that's the 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 one chapter in the book that I, I, I had the most difficulty writing was I, I tried to do a a two thousand year sketch of it's it, ludicrous to say it out loud now, but I I try to do a a sketch of church history of union with Christ for my conscientious readers who would be asking, well, who are you to say it's at the center and heart of the gospel? You're you're some pastor we've never heard of who lives in Los Angeles, and I was trying to say in that chapter, Hank, this is not my idea. This actually. You can pick your theological hero from Augustine to Luther to Calvin to Wesley to Edwards uh, to John Owen to C.S. Lewis. You you can pick your hero, and I can show you that union with Christ was at the heart of their theological program. Even if they meant something slightly different by it, they all agreed this was at the heart of the gospel. So this isn't my idea. This is... This is an idea that actually the best and most conscientious hearts and minds, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox, could sit around a table and say, yes, yes, that is the good news. If you think about deification, I mean, you have to, this is inextricably bound together with the church. Um, because the church is a spiritual gymnasium in which you receive graces. And I, I was very heartened when I read. Uh, in your book, the weight that you put uh, on, on on the graces that we receive in the church, uh, whether it's the grace of baptism or the grace of of uh, the fellowship of the Lord's communion, the Eucharist, the Mass. I mean, it's referred to in various ways, but there's there, there's something that happens that energizes us, that gives us the ability to experience a union with God by partaking in these sacraments, and you can't do that apart from the church, and therefore the Christian life cannot, by definition, be some kind of individualistic endeavor. Yes. Hank, all the the pieces are falling into place. I mean, when when union with Christ is lost, it explains our low view of the church, but it also explains our low view of the sacraments. Uh, Again, not not universally, but why do so many Protestants have a view of the sacraments so at odds with uh, our tradition? 
and our, they don't even know our tradition. And I would say, well, it's because we've lost union with Christ as an idea that the sacraments are how the living Christ nourishes our faith uh, experientially um, and truly uh, and spiritually. So the sacraments are uh, how we live out our union with Christ. Uh, the sacraments are uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper, absolutely vital. Meditating on the Bible, the, where the living Word communicates with us. The, that's why the Bible is living and active, because the, the living Christ, who is in us, the same, the same Spirit that inspired those words is the same Spirit that is in us, and speaks Spirit to Spirit. Um, union with Christ is how the Bible becomes a burning bush again, out of which God speaks to us. So... Recovering union with Christ helps us helps us so much, not just with how we view the church, but how we view what you've called these means of grace. Talk about the art of abiding. I, I, I love the the metaphors, the examples uh, that you use in the book, and 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 sailing is 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 my favorite one, perhaps in in, in the whole of the book. Uh, a, a good metaphor for our life with God. We're always dependent on a power. Uh, outside of ourselves, cash out how you use that sailing metaphor. Yeah, we're we're not life with God is not a motorboat where we're in control, but neither is it a, a raft where we're just floating along. We we are dependent, as in sailing, we are dependent on a power outside of us to move us. Um, in the sense that. Uh, all of change, uh, all, all of transformation is by the grace of God. So we are always dependent on God's power uh, from start to finish. And yet, as in sailing, it is incumbent upon us to draw the sail, uh, to to catch the wind, as it were. Um, and I, I talk to people up all the time who say, I, I, I feel very close, I, I feel very far away from God. And one of my first questions is, are, are you drawing near to God? Are you, um, are you availing yourself of the means God has provided for you to know and commune with Him? And, and do, you un, do you see these means as means of communion, or do you see them as rote duties that are kind of dry and arid? So I, I like that idea of we have to become skilled in, in catching the wind but even as you catch the wind, you're not the power propelling yourself forward. You're a lot of times in the Christian life we think that we, you know, we ask, why am I not changing? And the, I think the picture I use in the book is it's like a man standing in a sailboat and blowing on his sail <laughs> and wondering why he's not moving. And no, we have to catch the wind, and yet we. We have to catch the wind. Yeah, and that really communicates. And, you know, another thing that communicates in your book is this, uh, I think you use the illustration of a piano. If you really want to be liberated and have this euphoric experience of being totally free in playing, you have to put in thousands and thousands of hours of discipline. It never changes. I mean, I think about this with respect to golf. I mean, I played golf for, for over 50 years, and... And and yet it requires this constant discipline. I mean, it's not as though I can say I have achieved and I don't have to work at it anymore. No, I get to work at it. And if I, you know, over the last year I was going through chemo treatments and so I couldn't play golf and now I'm trying to play golf and, and it's very, very difficult again. Uh, but it, it, it takes so much effort. But there's a euphoria in hitting a golf shot like you, you once did. Uh, there's a euphoria there that is worth it all. I mean, they just hit that one pure shot, and you say, wow, this was worth all the practice. So there's, there's a sense in which you have to really work at it. Uh, you have to work at these disciplines that you alluded to. Dallas Willard talks about the spirit of the disciplines. You've got to work at these disciplines in order to have this euphoric metaphysical experience. Absolutely, it's. Uh, I, I think. I think the phrase "second nature" is such a wonderful and instructive phrase. Uh, 
we we want the gospel uh, we want the gospel to become fluent for us, but to use another metaphor, like speaking a foreign language, you have to practice using this new lens, using this new perspective, using this new mindset. And that is, uh, I think for anyone who is conscientious about it, that is difficult and onerous and hard. And we don't say that enough, especially uh, as Western Christians. We're not talking about works righteousness. We're, you, you are united to Christ, you are safe, you are secure, so we're we're not talking about that, but we're saying now that you're united with Christ, uh, now you 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 press on to become who you are. Um, I think the analogy I use in the book is teaching my my little boy how to ride a bicycle. It was probably my my favorite picture in the book because it it's so poignant to me that I want my son uh, to be able to to enjoy riding his bicycle, and it was quite difficult and quite painful. Um, but I want him to do this so we can enjoy riding together, so we can enjoy being together. And that these, that's what these disciplines are. They are means to an end. They are means to experiencing. What, what you talk about the perfect golf shot, I think as Christians we can also say, uh, not always, but occasionally, God meets us uh, as we draw near to Him. And there is a sweetness there that, Hank, I dare say, not even not even your best uh, drawing five iron from 180 yards could, <laughs> could, could fill your heart of that's the right. sweetness of God's presence. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's a great metaphor, though. It's a it's a it's a great connection. You know, you said in your book, and I I don't want to get personal beyond where you want to get personal, but I mean, say what you want or neglect to say what you don't want to say. But you, you say in your book that there was a time you felt like a fraud, that there was a chasm between what you said you believed and what you were actually experiencing it, and and to some extent that became a driving force to 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 dig deeper yeah i i think um um i think there is a measure of health in that for all of us i i think if we're going to read the new testament with integrity i think you know jesus for instance jesus said he who believes in me out of his heart will flow rivers of living water and I think we need to ask ourselves, are, are rivers of living water flowing out of my life? Do I even know what that means? Would, would the people around me say, wow, there, there's living water flowing out of his life? And I think that collision between the promises of the Bible and our actual lived experience, I think that is a traumatic collision. And I want to say uh, to all of your listeners, if you're feeling that trauma, that that is a good trauma. That is a good, as, as T.S. Eliot said in one of his poems, and in order to grow better, our sickness must first grow worse. Uh, that you are on the road to healing if you're feeling that trauma. But I, I think most conscientious followers of Jesus at a certain point, they feel that. They, they, um, they look at the promises of the Bible, they look at their life, and they feel that gap. And they ask themselves, what am I supposed to do about this gap? And uh, I, I use the word fraud because I, I, I felt like the words I was saying and the life I was living, I'm, I'm not just talking about blatant hypocrisy. I'm more talking about I'm telling people how wonderful Jesus is, and in my own heart, am I sensing the sufficiency and completeness of Jesus? And, um, yeah, I, I, I think to get there, I think to arrive there, um, is, is a journey. And that union with Christ is both, um, 
it is both the end of the journey and it is both the means of the journey. That that Jesus says, that's right, uh, I, I am with you, um, and I will carry you all the way home. And we we are learning to walk with him. How's that? Yeah, I love it. And, and I also love the fact that you are underscoring continuously in your writing that there are dangerous half-truths that obscure critical realities. And maybe you can expand on that a little bit for, for those listening in, because so often we're faced with false choices. Yeah, false, false choices, when, whenever you have a false choice, you can know that your paradigm is broken. I mean, a, a false choice is um, uh, grace and uh, demand. That's a false choice. Um, or if you don't like the word demand, you can say, when Jesus says, take up your cross and, and follow me daily, that, that's a demand. Um, that's a false choice, and how, how do we hold these? Um, how do we hold these biblical truths together that we know are biblical? We know that Jesus said. Um, we know that the Bible says it is. It is not up to him who works, um, and yet we know that the Bible also says, "Strive to enter by the narrow gate." And how do you? How do you hold these truths together without canceling or annulling or or turning down the volume on one or the other? And uh, I, I think union with Christ. Uh, I mean, Hank, I, I'm kind of a. You're going to think I'm a one-trick pony because I, I I think we union with Christ helps us so much, but. I think union with Christ really does address some of the big debates the Christian world is having right now uh, about Christ and culture, about um, is salvation mainly about the church, or is it mainly about our moral standing with God? I, I don't want to get too technical, but these debates that are happening all over the church I feel like if union with Christ was our lens, it would it would bring a lot of clarity and a lot of healing, and there would be a lot more both and instead of either or. What about the answer to the Lord's high priestly prayer that we all may be as one? Sometimes when I when I even say that, uh, I think, "Wow, this is a panacea. It is impossible." But then immediately you think. Who am I, as a, a mere speck of dust, to question the living Lord of the universe who, who, who prayed this during his earthly sojourn, that we may be as one as, as, as I and the Father are one? That this, this oneness with respect to the body of Christ that we talked about earlier, how, did you ever feel like we're, this is never going to happen, this can't happen? I mean, what can we do in a practical way to, to, to work towards the answer uh, to our Lord's high priestly prayer? Well, let me, <clears throat> let me put John 17 in conversation with uh, Ephesians 2, which is another great uh, picture of unity in the in the Bible. Paul doesn't say that one day Jesus will tear down the dividing wall. He doesn't say that one day Jesus will make the two one. He says that Jesus has made the two one and has torn down the dividing wall. Uh, in his wonderful book, uh, Life Together, which is one of the great books on Christian community written in the last 100 years, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said uh, that the Christian community is not an ideal to be uh, realized. It is a reality to be embraced. Mm. And he says something so profound in that book. He said, people who love community destroy it, but people who love people create community wherever they go. Now, now that is, you talk about being practical, 
Bonhoeffer is saying, do you love your ideal of the Christian community? Because if you do, you'll hold other people hostage and you'll end up destroying community. Or do you love people? And do you see that God has brought you together? This is your brother. This is your sister. You don't know them. You don't feel like that's true. But it is a divine reality. Now, become who you are. Live into this. Live into... You are living a lie if you are living an unreconciled relationship with a brother or sister. And if you do that, you will create community. So to your question of John 17, uh, I read John 17 and Ephesians 2 alongside one another to say, uh, I have made you one now strive to live as one. That is beautifully said. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the fourth quarter of my life. Uh, there, there's no question I'm in the fourth quarter. I mean, the, the, there's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I don't like to admit it, but I am in the fourth quarter. You are like probably half my age. I don't even know how old you are, and I don't really care, but I know you're at least half my age. Um, but but I, it, when, when you're facing your own mortality, as I, I did last year in particular with my cancer, uh, when you, you, you think about your legacy, you think about where is my legacy, what, uh, what would I most want to have the peace about when I'm laying on my deathbed? Maybe it's hard for you to go there, but I mean, Billy Graham died recently. I mean, a lot of things were said about him. Um, Talk about what your life legacy, I mean, if you're thinking about it right now, what is it that you would have liked to accomplish with your life? Well, that's, uh, that's interesting that you, you mentioned Billy Graham, <clears throat> um, who I mean, was, was such a wonderful servant of God. But let's, let's apply this lens of union with Christ to this whole question of legacy. And it really gets at the deeper question of ambition. You know, what, what is your ambition? And if your ambition is, um, I want to know Christ, and I want to be completely expendable to His will. I, I, I want to be His servant, whatever He has for me. That I, I want my legacy to be how He judges me, not how anyone else judges me, because my goal is Him. My goal is not the verdict of men. My goal is the verdict of God. And if that is true, if, if, if communion with, Christ, with God is the goal and union with Christ is the path, then this whole question of significance and legacy gets recast. It really does. It's, uh, the same week Billy Graham died, a young physician uh, in his 30s in, in our community died. And his spouse uh, had spent most of the last two years caring for him. And I, I ask, you know, is is she living a significant life? You know, no one no one knows who she is. She is uh, behind the scenes caring for her sick and dying husband. Uh, and significance is faithfulness and. Whether or not, um, I think everyone involved in Christian ministry, Hank, this is, you, you asked me to be personal, I, I'll, I'll be as personal as I can. I think everyone involved in Christian ministry, that the passage in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verses 10 through 15, where, where Paul says, each, each one's work will be judged. Um, I, I, how I read that passage is, the Lord works through us and in spite of us, regardless of our motives, right? I mean, the God, God is at work to God be the glory. Yes. And if God chooses to use you, to God be the glory. And if you truly did it by Christ and for Christ, that will endure. And if you did it to the degree that it was for, for your name or for my name, to the degree we did things for our own name, that is what Paul calls wood, hay, and stubble. God, God still used you. God still worked in you, through you, and in spite of you. 
Um, but I'm, uh, I, I think this whole idea of legacy and, and significance, we have to put that on the altar and say, Lord, uh, the only thing I care about is being faithful and each man's work will be judged, the Bible says, each person's work. And on that day, the motives of our heart will be laid bare. And I, I hope privately that resets our ambitions. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, I love that passage, First Corinthians chapter, I th- think it's chapter 3. You know, there's no other foundation other, other than Jesus Christ, but you can build on that foundation. But it does, it does make clear uh, that we ought to be building with those things that endure, gold, silver, costly stones, as opposed to what you alluded to in the passage, wood, hay, and stubble, the things that the breath of God's mouth will consume. Yeah, I think we have to be careful assuming Billy Graham lived a more significant life than... Uh, in, in the great divorce, C.S. Lewis has a. Uh, I, I think her name is, if I'm mem- remembering correctly, it's something like Sarah Smith. Or it, the the point Lewis is making in that uh, in the great divorce is this woman whom no one on earth knew was a great hero in heaven, mm. and she was a great hero because she was godly and holy and humble, and that God sees that and God rewards that and. Our idea of significance has to be recast in living for the eyes, judgment, and approval of one. And whether or not we've lived a significant life, we'll leave that to God. Yeah, you know, that's something I think about often. Beware when all men speak well of you. I mean, because it's really not... Uh, the filter through which we should judge our lives. I think that's what you're getting at. I mean, the real uh, the real issue is uh, an audience of one. And speaking of reality, <laughs> that's all that is going to matter. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, what posterity think of you is vanity. Uh, and I, I think... I mean, one of the reasons with so many of us love Billy Graham is I think somewhere he said that. I, um, I, I think he was keenly aware that he held the approval of men very lightly. Uh, as Paul says, if I care about the approval of men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I loved your book. And uh, we're, we're excited all this month to be able to let people know about this book. But I, I think it is an enchanted reality that most of the the Christian world is unfamiliar with. And uh, as you've humbly said, you're you're excavating a treasure. Uh, you're not bringing something new to the table. But really, the way in which you laid this out, I think, is a, a great service to our generation. And uh, uh, there's no more central message to the gospel than this this message, and unfortunately many people are unfamiliar with it, but reading through your book will really help them understand this this central message. This I think you talk about this in the sense of dark matter, right? It's uh, it's all around us, uh, and, and it's entirely possible for something to be that central and for us not to know that it is central and even not, not, not to know what it is. Yes except the stakes are so much higher with union with Christ than dark matter. Uh, yes, but that's exactly that's exactly the point. I mean, I hope, Hank, I love that you loved the book, and I, I hope more people, um, I mean, the, the, the light bulb you had is or what I hope more and more people have of, wow, this, this is good news, this is the gospel, and I, I want everyone to know about this wonderful biblical truth of union with Christ. Well, it has been my pleasure to host you for Hank Unplugged. Uh, I I know that this conversation has been stimulating to a lot of people listening in, and I want to mention to those people that are listening in that you can have uh, a really significant role in the process of the Hank Unplugged podcast. When you go to iTunes and give it a five-star rating, means that people all over the world are exposed to it in ever-increasing numbers. So your action step, go to iTunes, give it a five-star rating, and also share this podcast 
uh, with your friends and your family members, with your circle of influence. And again, the, the great conversations get out to more and more people. I was so delighted uh, that the very first Hank Unplugged podcast got to number six in its space. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of podcasts got to number six in its space, but that's because people go to iTunes and give us a five-star rating and people all over the world get to listening to these conversations. So thank you so much uh, for, for writing the book and for the openness and candor of the conversation today. Hank, it was an honor to, to be on your show. I, I just, I, I really enjoyed, we could have talked all afternoon. So I, I enjoyed our conversation and, um, if you're ever in LA, I'll see if we I can get you onto a golf course. <laughs> well, you know, I used to live in uh, Orange County. Lived in Orange County for many, many years. So I come to LA quite a bit. So we'll have to we'll have to connect sometime. I I'd love that. And, and please let me know when the the show is uh, being broadcast. I'd love to to let my circle know about it. Yeah, we'll we'll absolutely do that. It'll probably be up and running in a couple of weeks' time, but we'll we'll give you a heads up on it. Okay, Hank. Well, wonderful to talk with you and uh, to be continued. Bless you, my brother. And again, uh, thank you for tuning in to this edition of Hank Unplugged. It is the podcast that brings some of the most informative, interesting, and inspirational people on the planet directly to you. And today was no exception. So thanks for tuning in. Look forward to seeing you next time with another episode of Hank Unplugged.